Good. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Rich Schmidt. Uh, we're here with Doug Tunnell at Brick House Vineyards. It's uh, July 11, 2019. Thanks so much for joining us today, Doug. We really appreciate this. Pleasure. Uh, Honor. Let's start by asking uh, why wine? Why wine? Wow, that's sort of a big question. Um, because I love it, uh, and and I love the people around it, I, the community as well, and um, it's just a great pursuit. Never a dull moment. I I guess I bore. I get bored easily, <laughs> and you know, having a vineyard and a small winery in the North Willamette Valley, you never have an opportunity to get bored. Uh, something is always coming up, <laughs> whether it's the next spray or broken destemmer or the well goes dry or you name it. And um, and I, I, I guess I thrive on that. I, it's uh, what gets me up in the morning. Mm -hmm. So it's just been, um, yeah, it's a great way to live. Yeah. Tell us a bit about what you're doing before you got into wine. Well, so I, um, Obviously, I was a student, uh, not at Linfield, I'm afraid, uh, <laughs> at another small private liberal arts college nearby um, that will remain nameless. <laughs> um, but uh, after, well, while I was a student, I spent, um, I spent about, well, six months or so in North Africa on an overseas study program. Uh, and, and that was so rewarding and sort of life-changing that when I came back, uh, I left campus again for the Southwest. I, I spent a good part of my four-year college experience not at a four-year college, <laughs> but that was good too because it introduced me to um, the Middle East and to Arab culture. I, in Tunisia, I lived in an Arab home. Uh, I had Arab host brothers that were really good friends, became good friends, um, and that then inspired me to be interested in uh, the Middle East in a more general and a political way. Mm -hmm. So I, after college, uh, went off um, as a freelance journalist to uh, the Middle East, to Beirut, um, and I spent time in Beirut writing, and then I ran out of money and I went to Saudi Arabia where I could earn a lot of money in a short time. And then I came back and went to Columbia Graduate School in journalism, uh, and then it, at Columbia met some folks from CBS News, and then spent the next almost 18 years of my life working at CBS as a foreign correspondent, so I was based overseas the whole time. Uh, well, I was based, at, my last assignment was in Miami, but that was considered to be a South American bureau. I mean, we were traveling in and out of mm -hmm. Miami mm -hmm. to all points in Latin America. So um, that's what I was doing before. Uh, and as I say, that was almost 18 years or so um, and at CBS. And then at some point I realized, um, well, I realized first of all, while I was still doing that, that all of my free time I was spending in a vineyard someplace. I lived in France, I lived in Germany, uh, I lived in a little wine town in Germany, and and I'd get two or three days off, and I look around and I go, I'm in a vineyard again, what's that about? <laughs> you know, I, I better listen to that. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I did, and so when my last contract came up uh, in 1992, I had already purchased this farm and was developing the vineyard, uh, and I decided that that's what I wanted to do. And so I moved back here. I grew up around here, so it's, it was coming home again. I have family around, and, mm -hmm. um, and so started to develop this, and here we are. So before we talk about that, I have one more kind of follow-up question about your time as a foreign correspondent. Tell me, that's kind of an unusual background for someone in the industry. Tell me about kind of some of the uh, interesting uh, challenges along the way, interesting things you learned or kind of uh, what you took away from that uh, going forward in life. Well, uh, I learned a lot. It was, you know, it was 18 years of learning and, and especially when you're, you're hopping around the world. Um, you know, kind of diving or parachuting into different situations. Uh, some of them very pleasant and some of them very <laughs> unpleasant. Um, so you you learn to think fast and to think on your feet. Um, I learned to be very resourceful because uh, we didn't always have the resources that we need. Um, things were technologically much different in the business then. Uh, we didn't have cameras like this one. Um, we, at, when I first started, we had to deal with film, 
mm-hmm. whole different galaxy mm-hmm. uh, of problems and issues. And we were we were in a remote part uh, of the world where there was really only one ground station uh, in the Middle East that that was available to us in the Arab world uh, in Amman, Jordan. So uh, logistics were just really difficult, uh, and you had to plan, plan ahead mm-hmm. uh, to in order to get your story out, mm-hmm. especially on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Um, this is, now I'm going back to Beirut days. It wasn't that challenging in later days in Paris or in, in Bonn, West Germany, mm-hmm. uh, but there were other challenges there too. Yeah. I also learned, I think that, uh, which is a lifelong lesson for me, that um, the veneer of civilization is very, very thin. And it doesn't take much uh, for that veneer to be punctured. And it's not, it can be very unpleasant, Mm -hmm. the results. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's taught me, I think, to uh, really cherish uh, the gifts that we have here and the gifts that I have in my life and to cherish the, the the society and the culture and the systems that we have that that are our daily lives here um, because I've seen it the other way mm-hmm. and I don't regret that I'm glad I've had that experience but I would well what I tried to do when I was working was try to share that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> throughout as a theme mm-hmm. like look folks this is what can happen mm-hmm. so sure. yeah so you mentioned that you had purchased this property before you formally got out of the business. What was it about here? Why did you choose this spot uh, particularly? Well, I, I, uh, going back before I found the spot, it, it was about 1987, I think, I read an article in the New York Times Magazine about this French family that purchased land in the Dundee Hills and we were going to grow Pinot Noir and make wine. Do you want to cut it off for this? All good. You're good? Okay. Um, and that, of course, it's the Duran family. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I read, I was living in Paris at the time, when I, when I read that they were going to invest and plant and, and grow wine here, uh, I immediately called home. My mother uh, grew up on farms in Yamhill County. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father is also a Linfield graduate. They both graduated from Linfield in the 30s. Um, and so she knew people here. And I said, we've got to find an old farm. I'll invest in it, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And it took a couple of years, but this is the place. Um, and when I was tipped off by one of the family friends that this was on the market, uh, we came down the driveway and got about halfway down the driveway, took a look around and said, yeah, this is the place, um, and bought it literally almost spot on, you know, just uh, immediately, um, and then started developing it. What drew you to it? Well, why was it the place? Well, uh, so we did some due diligence. I mean, at the time, very little or much less was known about suitable suitable soils for wine grapes, but it was uh, one of the recommended soil types. Um, It also had the the right, uh, what I thought was the right elevation and the right general aspect. Uh, The farm is basically kind of a southeast facing bowl. Uh, The drainage runs to the southeast and so that I think is um, optimum. I I still believe that that's a great deal. And it had a lot of variation in the terrain. So the vineyard is not just uh, one consistent face. It's got a lot of rolls and hills and and aspects of north face and aspects of west face. And and that for an estate vineyard and uh, making estate wines is really an asset that I really didn't understand back in the day, but I certainly do now, that you can basically farm or harvest according to the climate and to the year and to the vintage, uh, those aspects in different ways. Mm-hmm. And for example, in a, in a really warm year, perhaps some of the best fruit you're going to get is off your north face, mm-hmm. the cooler side, mm-hmm. you know. But that, that understanding came with time. Mm-hmm. But, I, but it, it has proved to be a real asset. I'm curious to you, uh, for you as someone who grew up in the area and then left for a while, what was it like hearing that Oregon was developing this wine industry and that the French were investing in it? Was it what did that what did that kind of say to you? Well, it was pretty surprising. I mean, um, I I had kind of kept an eye on the Oregon wine industry ever since I was in college, as a matter of fact. Um, 
uh, sort of a long story, but I will digress. Uh, when I was in school, I think I was about a sophomore, I had, I, I grew up, my parents were both teachers, educators, and so we were not wealthy, but I had a, met, a, met a friend in college who was from a very wealthy family in Southern California. And um, I said to him one day, not knowing anything about money or finance or investment, I said, Jim, if you had $10,000, which to me was a big amount at that time, to invest uh, here, what would you do with it? Mm -hmm. And I, I will never forget, Jim said, you know, there are some guys out in the Tualatin and Yamhill Valleys that are growing this particular kind of grape mm -hmm. that doesn't do very well in all parts of the world. It's kind of unique. And I might look at some land, for, you know, in a place like that. Now, this is, I'm like a sophomore in college, and it is just sort of a, a dream, a hypothetical, totally hypothetical. Um, but it stuck with me, you know, and, and it kept me kind of keeping an eye on things uh, over the time. And then, and then the... And then when the Druans invested, that was when I decided, yeah, I had, I had the funds that I could invest at that time, mm -hmm. and it was time to pull the trigger, mm -hmm. you know. Tell me a little bit about the land. Uh, did, when you, when you bought, purchased the land and you found the property, what, did you know the extent of what you were going to have to do to it at that time? No. I, I mean, I wasn't an experienced grape grower, you know, or winemaker, so I really uh, was kind of making it up as I go along and relying on some really good uh, friends and people that, that I hired to help me out. Uh, Joel Myers, you know, from uh, his his nursery, helped me uh, develop and lay out the first parts of the vineyard. Uh, John Paul at Cameron uh, bought grapes from me. Myron Redford uh, at Amity bought grapes from me and uh, certainly gave me uh, his style of advice. <laughs> Myron's particular style and John Paul's particular style. I mean, uh, we're talking about some of the great characters here. Uh, and my friend Michael Etzel, uh, we still uh, get together and taste together a lot and travel together and at Beau uh, uh and we just share information, you know. Um, so, I mean, that I guess that's one thing that I really love is uh, this is a it's a lifelong learning experience. I don't pretend to know everything, and and I don't pretend to have it all down. Every vintage is different. Uh, there are no recipes, you know, so you're kind of making it up as you go along mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully a little wiser each vintage, we hope. Sure, yeah. of course. Yeah. Did you have a, a goal? So when you when you decided to invest in grapes and plant grapes, uh, did you have a goal in mind? Were you, were you thinking in terms of just farming? Were you thinking yes. beyond that? No, absolutely. I was thinking in terms of farming that because I thought, well, that's something that I could do. I could pick up. Uh, my grandfather was a farmer, and I, you know, I could perhaps just learn that. Um, uh, winemaking was totally daunting to me. I didn't ever really expect to be a winemaker. So my initial goal was to grow certified organic Pinot Noir or wine grapes mm -hmm. in the North Willamette. And at the time, there was one other vineyard that was doing that. The Cattrell Brothers mm -hmm. uh, had a vineyard that they were farming organically, mm -hmm. but that was about it, mm -hmm. as far as I know. And um, so it was, there, there was a lot of making it up uh, going on. At that time, we, we had very, very few tools uh, that would fall into the organic category, far less than we have now, far less. So, um, but that was my goal. Winemaking only came along later when I realized that I wasn't making any money growing grapes. <laughs> so I, thought, I better make some wine. And, and then came the realization that if I'm gonna make wine, I probably better do it myself. Otherwise, you're in for the possibility of a revolving door mm -hmm. of winemakers having, relying on other people all the time. Mm -hmm. And you can't really develop, well, I, you can, but it's difficult, I think, to develop a house style, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, especially if your goal is an estate mm -hmm. producer, which is what we do and what we strive for. So. Mm -hmm. Why organic? Why, so, why did you make that decision so early? When I was a kid, I grew up on the banks of the Great Muddy Willamette River, just below two pulp mills mm -hmm. at Oregon City, West Lynn. Mm -hmm. And and my my friends, my buddies at the time, we we grew up river rats. We were in the river all the time, fishing and boating and you know swimming and anything we could do, exploring. And um, 
uh, and I just I, I saw firsthand all of the pollution that was coming out of those mills and so I decided when um, with the help of a couple of other friends who said well you could do this organically mm -hmm. um, you know I, I said you know if we're gonna be farming in that same watershed I don't want to contribute uh, to the kind of things that I saw and I knew about uh, in the river uh, when I was a kid mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it that was really the biggest inspiration, you know, and and the fact that it was, uh, it wasn't being done, but but I was advised by people who know, knew much more than me that it was possible, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, well, if it's possible, why are people doing it, you know, and um, leave a leave a small footprint. So that was that was the initial, mm -hmm. yeah. I've I've since come to believe that, in fact, it makes better grapes and and better grapes make better wine. That's an arguable point. I'm sure others <laughs> would perhaps disagree, but I really, I really do believe that. So how did you go about not really knowing how to grow grapes and not really having the kind of organic tools that we do now? How did you go about learning how to grow grapes, and especially organically? Well, relying, as I said, uh, to a great extent on guys like Joel Myers, mm -hmm. uh, who knew about how to grow grapes mm -hmm. and, and who knew what the limits of uh, sort of the organic programs were at the time. Uh, we put the whole farm into an organic certification in 1990, mm -hmm. uh, and it was well before the federal uh, National Organic Program came into being mm -hmm. um, and we relied on Oregon Tilth which was just this little teeny organization at the time it was literally one woman working out of a trailer along the Tualatin River you know uh, was Oregon Tilth but it was but it was I think the first uh, organic certifier in the country um, so Oregon had a long history mm -hmm draw on that, draw on on what resource there was uh, at Tilth, but also, as I say, from, from real grape experts like, mm -hmm. like Joel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you've developed this now, how, what would you, how would you describe your grape growing philosophy? Well, we've, uh, so we've evolved now uh, from organic to biodynamic growing, and, and that really is our philosophy. That's what we practice now and do. And as, you know, uh, I mean, the elevator speech, you know, it's, it's organic and more, right? So it, um, it's uh, using organic techniques, but then adding uh, some really sort of really interesting uh, aspects and products, mm -hmm. uh, teas, uh, you know, compost teas, mm -hmm. building compost piles, using compost as a fertilizer source, mm -hmm. um, all of that was added along the way. You now, it's how long has it been now? It's since 2003, three, four, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. We certified Biodynamic in 2005. Mm -hmm. uh, and so philosophically, there's a lot I like about that. Um, one of the main things that, that is the, the whole biodynamic notion of looking at your farm as uh, a, a living organism, mm -hmm. because um, you you come to if you if you live in the middle of it as we do, <laughs> you know you come to understand that I mean it's like your body in a way, and and what you do to it here impacts what happens there. Mm -hmm. And if that is an unhealthy area, it can drag down and have unforeseen consequences elsewhere. Um, and so you learn to really pay attention. Yeah, paying attention is really important. Um, one of, of my favorite sayings, I think it's attributed to the Italians, is the best fertilizer is the footprint of the owner. And I think I think that's it's a biodynamic conce concept. Mm -hmm. I think really. I mean, because so much in biodynamics depends on um, observation mm -hmm. and seeing what's going on in the vines and being able to respond. And also, um, I like the philosophical notion that that we as farmers, as vineyardists, uh, are not. We're not distant from the vines mm -hmm. we we have a real role integral role alongside them mm -hmm. you know to uh, help them to produce the best the way they can the best fruit possible and and that notion 
it's really uh, unlike a lot of the approach of, of modern science in a way or a mo really any modern project where you know we've got our expertise and our human entity our brains that know all this stuff and we manipulate out there you know this sort of other world mm -hmm. well no we are in the biodynamic world we are part of that world we are integral to it and and that forces a certain responsibility but also a certain understanding you know um, and, and you you know we we begin to feel and think and see all the things around us our animals our family our vines our buildings I mean everything around is basically part of that organism mm -hmm. and you deal with it that way and I just think that's a really healthy way and uh, it's part of part of why we really emphasize here the fact that it's an estate operation. We don't buy fruit from elsewhere. We grow it all ourselves, and we live within several hundred meters from every vine. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. So you've been so you've been biodynamic for roughly 15 years now. Tell me about the effect you've seen on the vines, on the grapes, and and on the wine from from that. Well. Um, it's I would I would say the effects are um, uh, sort of step by step mm -hmm. there's there's not any one big like three years later all of a sudden it bloomed mm -hmm. no it's it's a real incremental process mm -hmm. but what we see uh, is I, I see, and part of this is also the the age, aging of the vines too I mean so it's 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 a little hard to to separate out the maturity of the vines and the maturity of the vineyard and the impacts of the biodynamics over 15 years but what we see is um, uh, really healthier vines mm -hmm. and uh, that produce fruit that is more um, I believe more um, conducive to making really complex wines mm -hmm. um, we because we, we, we also don't irrigate mm -hmm. so we have thicker skins I believe um, as a result we've got a lot of competition for the vines out there which is their native way mm -hmm. um, we have a vine just over by the winery that's growing up in a tree and we just let it grow because that it's sort of the demonstration vine people say well you know what are these vines about vines evolved out of the forest mm -hmm. the reason that they are vines is so that they could grow into the canopy and reach sunlight mm -hmm. um, and so we allow that to happen and and on the vineyard floor we have a lot of competition as well um, and and I just think that 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 puts the vines in a kind of a more comfortable place where where their historic DNA is is rooted if you will <laughs> rooted yeah <laughs> So you, you started off, you're thinking you're going to grow grapes, you're going to sell them. Uh, tell me about kind of the evolution, uh, the growth of the estate, and then there, when you said your decision to eventually make wine, and then kind of how you went about that process. Sure. Um, well, we, you know, we didn't plant everything all at once. Uh, we've got about 30 acres of vines now, um, which I think is about 40,000 vines, mm -hmm. which kind of astounds me when I think about it. 40,000 vines, I don't know where they all came from. <laughs> um, but we started, you know, acre by acre, you know, at a time, uh, which was what we could afford. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, it, and we are still planting. We planted another like half an acre just last winter uh, or last fall. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, that was kind of the way we developed uh, the the vineyard, but it, it still was very expensive. And as you say, I was selling fruit, but I realized that selling fruit was really pretty break even. And so I, I really had better learn how to do this. Now, to learn how to do this, I had asked a friend, Steve Dorner at Christum, to custom crush some wine for us and make some wine for us. And I really uh, I would deliver my grapes and then work with Steve and hang out and you know keep my eyes open and talk with him and and this went on for several years um, and so in that process I finally became confident enough that I knew enough uh, to make some of the first wines here uh, so th at that point then I began to transform this old horse barn into a small winery uh, and that's actually still where we make all the wines um, but it was a yeah it was an incremental process and I and as I say I learned a lot 
uh, having Steve make the first vintages, but I also learned a lot from my friend Michael, from John Paul, mm -hmm. from Myron. I mean, the people that were buying my grapes, I'd, I'd pump them. Um, Mark Vlasic at St. Innocent was a really great customer for Gosh, I think a decade, something like that. And, you know, a really knowledgeable guy. And it's a generous community, you know. Uh, people weren't afraid. I, there aren't very many secrets, despite what a lot of folks think. I, <laughs> you know, they, if, you, if you show an interest and you deliver your fruit and, you know, you work a little bit and get your hands dirty, you're going to learn stuff. And that's really the way it, I'm totally untrained. I've not been to school for this at all, but, yeah. So take me back a little bit when you were when you were deciding to plant and, and, and as you were growing, how did you decide what you wanted to plant uh, in terms of varietal and then beyond that, how did you kind of go about acquiring the, the plants? Yeah, so, um, you know, I spent a lot of time in Burgundy and um, and I, I realized, I mean, if, if you take Pinot Noir as sort of the marker, you know, uh, and, and at the time, uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, I could see that Pinot Noir was the future. It was the one that was that special grape that my friend Jim talked about, well, those years before in college. Um, and, and if you take uh, Pinot Noir as the marker and you look at the grapes that grow successfully historically around Pinot Noir in Burgundy, well, the top two are Chardonnay mm. uh, and the third Gamay Noir. So that was the decision. Um, I wanted. I didn't want to have just Pinot Noir. I, I do believe that there is some real benefits in having some diversity, and so we wanted to have three varieties. Pinot Noir being the primary one, but then also Chardonnay and and Gamay, um, and that. I mean, that just really grew out of what I saw historically in Burgundy uh, was the deal. Uh, what was the other part of your question? Uh, how, especially with Gamay, how did you go about uh, sort of finding a st oh. stock to plant here? Yeah, no, the Gamay actually was, uh, it kind of fell into my lap. So, um, as I mentioned, Joel Myers uh, was helping me lay out the Pinot Noir. And I was talking to him and he said, well, I've got all these old, these Gamay cuttings uh, that David Adelsheim brought into the, the state from France. David never liked the wine from them, which I've since uh, established, David admits he didn't like going from them, <laughs> but he, there, were, there were two different clones of Gamay in Joel's nursery that Joel didn't know what to do with. Uh, and so I said, you know, I'll buy, I'll buy those and we'll plant those. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did just up there as the first planting of those two clones. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, it turned out that it, that worked out so well. <laughs> Gamay did so well and still to this day does so well in our soil and in our site or our elevation uh, that we planted more, you know, and uh, so now we've got almost five acres, I think, of Gamay of four different clones. Um, and the clonal, so that the first two clones came from Joel's nursery. The second two clones I've acquired from a nursery in California where they have very limited supplies. I gather there's quite a run on these things now, but I managed to get in before people were interested in them. <laughs> um, and they were really producing some real, really nice wines. Um, so that's the Gamay story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Pinot Noir story was a little different. It's kind of funny. Um, I found Pinot Noir cuttings, uh, own rooted cuttings, from a nursery down in Salem. Mm -hmm. And um, I was still working at CBS at the time, and I was on assignment in uh, Bogota, Colombia. Uh, it was during the days of the drug wars, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Pablo Escobar days. And so I'm in this hotel room and I, I realize like it's time to order those vines. So I get a, get a phone call through to this nursery and I introduce myself and say I want to buy these, these Pinot Noir planting cut, cuttings. And the guy goes, yeah, where are you calling from? I go, Bogota, Colombia. And he goes, oh, right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but he sold them to me anyway. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it all worked out. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was our first uh, 10 acres, actually, of, of Pinot Noir. That was actually our biggest planting. Yeah. To, and so it was in um, 1989. Yeah. Yeah, I think 89 or it was it 88. 89. Yeah. 
You, you talked a little bit earlier about the, the layout of this property and the, and the, the various facing. Uh, tell me a little about how you would describe the terroir here. What is it about Brick House? What, what, what is it you taste when you taste a Brick House wine? So the, the, all of the farm is um, sedimentary clay loam soil. Uh, it's marine sediment. So the whole place was underwater uh, back, you know, eons ago, before the Coast Range raised up, uh, forming what is today the Coast Range. And we sort of are on the trailing end of that uplift. Um, and uh, so the soils, if you can imagine taking sea bottom and drying it out, well, that's pretty much what we've got here. Mm -hmm. um, you can still find little teeny microscopic seashells and stuff in the soil. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's also laden with silica, uh, which I think is really important. I don't understand why. Someday, maybe we will. <laughs> but the silica is a common thread with the soils of Beaujolais. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about Gamay growing on this farm or on that kind of sedimentary soil, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's got two uh, similarities between here and, and the soils of Beaujolais. Silica being a primary one, mm -hmm. their soils too, rich in this shiny, sparkly, little sandy stuff and also uh, low pH. Mm -hmm. We have throughout the farm very low pH, uh, meaning high acidic uh, mm -hmm. soil, 5.5, uh, you know, 5.6 kind of thing, which is a bit of a struggle because uh, it's harder for plants to take up nutrient in a low pH environment. Uh, but obviously uh, the grapevines are able to do that. We do what we can to try to bump that pH up as much as possible. But you know, it's not easy to do when you're talking about you know, 30 acres of soil. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a it's a big number. Um, so if we plant plant a new block, we put some lime in, um, and you know, occasionally we'll we'll put in some other fertilizers too to try to help them. We've got after these last few years, uh, we've got drought stress in some parts of the vineyard, and we've gone in and fertilized those parts specifically with kind of point fertilization uh, because the vines are showing mm -hmm. some real stress. It's been so dry in the last five years mm -hmm. uh, relative to what they were used to when we first put them in the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Um, so the result then is a kind of a low vigor environment for the vineyard. Uh, the vines, I was looking at some vines down along 99 uh, in Dundee. They were real close to the highway, very low. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, wow, just yesterday I was, I drove by and I go, wow, look at that canopy. I mean, you know, thick, tall, and they'd already hedged. And I mean, it, there's just so much more vigor. Mm -hmm. Here we have that low vigor environment, thinner canopies. Um, and to my mind, I believe that's a benefit because um, we have better air circulation with fewer leaves. Uh, we have enough leaves, obviously, to ripen fruit, but not an excess amount. Uh, and so the vines are, I think, more attuned to putting their energy into survival and to, f and to the, the line, into what is the seed or the grape you know, in order to survive. Um, and, and that's obviously important to me. Uh, wine made out of leaves is not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> wine made out of grapes is better. So uh, we want the vines to be thinking about that, mm -hmm. about, um, about survival and fruit, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. You talked a little about, about Steve and Mark and some of the other people who had kind of helped you, John Paul, and people who had helped you early on in winemaking. So tell me what you took from them and, and sort of developed into your own sort of winemaking philosophy. What is it you want your wines to be? Well, the first thing that comes to mind was something that I learned from Steve. Uh, actually, two things. Um, there's more than that, but two <laughs> primary things. Um, is uh, Steve has always worked with native yeasts, mm -hmm. uh, indigenous yeasts, and that is a very important thing here. Um, I, and so I, I began, when I began making wine, using indigenous or native yeasts and have never used any cultured strain or, or laboratory strain in our old barn winery from day one. Mm -hmm. uh, we've never uh, fermented with a cultured strain any wine. So um, what that's led to 
after many years of successful fermentations. Um, let's see, three years ago, four years ago, we started um, DNA profiling our yeast strains. And what we've discovered is really fascinating, um, along with the help of Jeremy Weiss uh, from Linfield mm -hmm. uh, College, um, we have uh, DNA profiled um, all the strains that are involved in our fermentations, but there's one that is the dominant strain, that is the finishing strain, um, that is, uh, as far as we know right now, is completely unique. We can't, we have not been able to find a match in the national uh, science, uh, What's the, it's the national, it's a database of, of DNA sequencing mm -hmm. uh, for the National Institute of Health. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it appears that we've got something really unique going on. We're still in that research. We've got like three years now of data uh, and we will take again more data this year and expand and try to address some further questions mm -hmm. um, about its uniqueness of this strain. Mm -hmm. uh, is this strain to be found in a neighboring vineyard? Mm -hmm. You know, but it, it it presents certain problems to try to get answers to that, uh, and we're going to have to work those out. We just had a meeting about this in the, a few days ago, uh, but we will be taking more samples. So native yeast, big deal here um, yeah, at Brickhouse. Um, the other thing is uh, Steve's use of whole cluster fermentation, something that I adopted as well early on, and I've kind of worked with and in, um, in various degrees and you know because not obviously not every vintage is the same in Oregon and not every vintage is suitable for a whole cluster fermentation I think I mean that's my view uh, some people take it a different way but um, and so I've, I've been working all these years now to try to figure out when I think whole cluster works best and to what degree you know it's there are a lot of variations you don't have to do a hundred percent you can do 25 or 50 or you know any number in between uh, and so that those are a couple of things that have really shaped uh, the way that I approach making the wine what is it about whole cluster that, that appeals to you as a winemaker well uh, First of all, I think that it, in a general sense, it adds a whole other layer of um, uh, especially aromatics, but also of flavor and texture. Um, and, that, and that texture can be a little off-putting if you get it wrong or you do too much mm -hmm. because it can be more tannic. Mm -hmm. uh, the tannins in the skins, if they're not handled properly. Um, but, but over time, it, you, you know, if you're making wine for five years or eight years out, you know, that's not a concern. Uh, the problem that can uh, arise is, you know, we're a society of immediate gratification, right? I bought that case of wine, damn it, and I want to taste it now, and I want to drink it with my friends in the next month. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that's not going to be too good if you're talking about 100% whole cluster wine. It's, you know, those wines just need time to evolve. So it's you know it's a whole balance that you know a wine maker has to work on like kind of w what time frame are you shooting for for your wines to really show the best and then you you have to correspond that with the characteristics of the vintage and the characteristics of the vineyard you know because not all stems you know like not all grapes from our vineyard come in looking exactly the same and the same goes for the stems mm -hmm. uh, and again vintage vintage after vintage location after location so there's a there's a lot of variables there to work with and uh, and again that's another thing that I love about winemaking because you know you got to keep your you got to keep your eyes open and keep sharp and keep thinking if you're gonna move it ahead and and really overall my entire goal uh, is just to make better wine every year, you know, after, from our vineyard. I mean, that's, that's the name of the game. And by better wine, wine that I like more, wine that our customers like more, mm -hmm. delicious wine. <laughs> yeah. Let's switch gears a little bit here and talk about your relationship with Linfield a little bit. So tell me about uh, sort of how your relationship with Linfield College began and how you ended up on the Board of Trustees. Sure. Well, both my parents, as I mentioned, uh, graduated from Linfield in the 30s. And um, it was a huge part of their growing up, of their lives. Um, they 
they both got their degrees and then went on, you know, to be, as I said, educators. My mom was a teacher. My dad was a teacher and then became a, a school administrator, a superintendent. Uh, lifelong careers. And, um, and, and they met, I mean, they, they met at Linfield and married, you know, shortly after they graduated. So um, I wouldn't be here without Linfield, let's put it that way. <laughs> My grandmother's house uh, is just across the highway. Um, it's no longer hers, uh, obviously she's long gone, but, but I remember as a little boy going to visit grandma and then we'd go over to the Oak Grove and play mm -hmm. and, you know. Um, so it has, it has strong emotional bonds uh, and historic, family historic, historic bonds. Um, and because of that, uh, over time, I was I was asked to become a trustee um, a number of years ago uh, by Vivian Bull, I think initially, and I, I kind of had to say no because I was involved at the time on the board of Oregon Public Broadcasting, and I that was taking up time, and I had a business to run and develop, so I realized I can't take on both. And mm -hmm. um, But over time, I then term limited out at o Oregon Public Broadcasting, and, and Tom Helley came along. And I think, yeah, I think Tom, yeah, was, Tom was the guy who, who then asked me again. And, and uh, Tom is a dear friend, and I was getting to know him at the time and really liked him, and I just said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And I'll do it basically to honor my mom and dad mm -hmm. you know so uh, it's really that's in the back of my mind and my support for linfield stems from that family history mm -hmm. yeah even though i didn't go there <laughs> <laughs> honorarily at least <laughs> well yeah I mean, <laughs> so what's so. the what's the importance to you of being a trustee what, what kind of difference did you feel like you could make joining a board like that well you know at the time that i came on i mean i think tom kind of had a glimmer in his eye about the notion of a wine program mm -hmm. uh, and so he was talking to a number of winery people including me and i it was very clear to me that that would be something uh, that i knew something about that i could help be helpful with mm -hmm. um, both in what I know, but also introductions and mm -hmm. you know people that I know and and all that, and uh, so that was that was pretty straightforward. Um, I'm largely unqualified in a number of other things. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me to read the balance sheet, you know. Um, but yeah, I I can help with stuff like that, and so it, uh, you know it just felt it felt good, yeah. Tell me a little bit about uh, if there's a, something you've been involved with on the board that you're particularly proud of or particular, that was particularly successful. Well, I would like to thank the wine program, honestly. Uh, I mean, I th you know, it, it's really, I think, an important program for the college. I think it was really well created. It's, it's grown and flourished and I think will continue to. I hope uh, it only makes sense. Let's face it. I mean, look where we are, <laughs> right? Uh, in the middle of a burgeoning, uh, globally acclaimed, mm -hmm. and more every year, uh, wine region. Mm -hmm. And uh, to not address that as a liberal arts college is is just sort of would be blind, you know. <laughs> so um, I think I think that's really that's been my main contribution in a lot of small ways uh, and help helped out on a lot of a lot of things and um, and very proud of that yeah so obviously Linfield's connection with the wine industry goes quite a ways back to IPNC at least if not before yeah, uh, yeah. tell me about how you've sort of seen the relationship grow between the college and the, and the industry as you've been a part of both now well, I mean, <laughs> so I'll tell you an IPNC story. Way back in, uh, I think it was 91 or 92, when I was still developing our vineyard, uh, I was still living in Coconut Grove, Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had, because I loved wine, I had a bunch of wino friends there. And there were some guys that were really serious wine collectors mm -hmm. that I came to know uh, in Florida. And one of them was a guy named Lois Charbonnet. Uh, and his wife Tony, and they were they were near neighbors in Coconut Grove. And Lois had a ridiculously large and valuable wine collection, and so he was interested in Pinot Noir. And I said, "Well, Lois, we're going to go back to Oregon. We're we're developing this vineyard, you know. And um, in July, there's going to be this thing called the International Pinot Noir Celebration. Why don't you and Tony join us, and we'll." Um, go to the IPNC together. Mm -hmm. I think you'll find it interesting. He goes, yeah, okay, that sounds pretty good. So, Lois grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, southern, real southern guy. And um, so, we arrived back in Oregon, and we 
go down to Linfield College campus and the early days of the thing were going on people were just gathering and and there's I think the first lunch or whatever and and um, and there's people having wonderful wines and there's food and the chefs are busy preparing all this great stuff and it was a beautiful day and Lloyd's looked over at me and he goes Doug I gotta tell you this ain't like no Baptist college I've ever been to before. <laughs> and it's true. That whole history is really uh, interesting and unique and, uh, and a credit uh, to Linfield's Baptists of the day, mm -hmm. you know, that they were uh, willing to take a leap and uh, host this, uh, this event. Um, and I, you know, there's, I, I think probably you've heard some of the, the humorous stories that, about the board meetings uh, that went on to decide these people don't drink, they spit. Mm -hmm. You know, you've heard these stories. Mm -hmm. And those are, those are treasures. I mean, it's, that's great. <laughs> Where do you think the relationship is going now? You talked about how the, the, the program is getting started and, and already kind of blooming the Linfield Wine Program. So what do you think as you look ahead at what Linfield's wine program will look like? What do you kind of hope it'll be in the next, say, decade? Oh boy. Um, well, I, I hope, I mean, maybe they're already, I'm, I might be a little bit out of touch, but maybe there's already a little more focus mm -hmm. uh, in the curriculum. Uh, and, and I'm not, I'm, I will say I'm not totally up to date on that, uh, but I think that there does need to be some focus with regard to uh, what's offered and, uh, and whether that includes uh, viticulture, uh, certainly enology uh, with the emphasis uh, uh, on the sciences at Linfield and, and the new science building, hello, hello. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, you know, it, it, those are areas where I would hope the wine uh, program is going to really grow, mm -hmm. um, and you know that's a, a bit the business aspect of it is really important. Uh, you know, we all I, I can't tell you how many times I have a conversation with a winemaker or somebody who wants to make wine uh, who says, you know, I really want to make wine or I really enjoy making wine, but then I have to sell it. You know, and it's. It's the part of the industry that many, many people completely ignore mm -hmm. before they get into it because it's not very romantic and it's not very tasty and it's a lot of work and it's increasingly, increasingly difficult mm -hmm. in these years. I mean, it, it is um, with the growth of wine industries, not only in Oregon, but everywhere in the country and, and abroad, uh, the pressure to find markets and to find reliable distribution, difficult, really hard. And I'm, I thank my lucky stars. We've got really strong relationships with, uh, uh, not a lot, excuse me, but a handful of excellent top-notch distributors in the United States. Um, and we've been doing business with some of them f since 1995. Uh, and so long-term relationships that are almost like family relationships. Um, so we're very, very lucky here. Mm -hmm. That's not the case if you're just starting out. Mm -hmm. It's you've really got to work hard. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think between the costs, comparing the costs of getting started then when I did and now, and between the difficulty of finding markets then and now, I'm not sure I could do it again. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it really requires a whole lot more knowledge and help and the rest and that's what Linfield can offer mm -hmm. you know there's I mean just off the top of my head I mean I I would uh, if we had the ability I would love to hire uh, a Linfield student that could help us with online sales mm -hmm. you know it's just that part mm -hmm. or with social media mm -hmm. you know um, we do we do that we do have online sales we do have social media and we work it out as best we can with the small team that we have. Mm -hmm. And certainly uh, my, my assistant winemaker, Savannah Mills, and, and our cellar master, Carrie Ann Irwin, who was, you met just here, um, are much better at social media and are really helpful with online stuff mm -hmm. you know, than, than I am. But um, they've got a lot of other work to do. 
you know, and Steve, our, our main marketing guy, he's busy with appointments, meeting people face to face and doing sales here in the winery mm -hmm. or traveling. You know, we, they all travel, they all go on the road. So do I, <laughs> uh, but you know, so yes, if we could find, you know, someone who is just focused on those aspects mm -hmm. and that's what Layfield could offer. And I, I'm not alone. There are a lot of wineries around that have more capital and are able to expand their team more easily and need to expand their team in order to satisfy demand mm -hmm. that the wine program could, could really offer that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I'm curious, we, we hear a lot in these interviews from people who came in the industry around when you did or, or before about, about the Drew Inn purchase and what a big moment that was in Oregon yeah. Wine. Yeah. So tell me about sort of uh, what, what the industry looked like as you entered it and, and some of the biggest, besides size, some of the biggest changes you've seen uh, in, in what the modern industry is now. Well, when I first uh, started tracking the Oregon wine industry and then invested in the farm, you know, it was still... Uh, considered to be kind of not really an industry <laughs> you know it was a bunch of lone wolves you know out there in the hills wearing their Birkenstocks um, Myron comes to mind you know Myron personified uh, that very you know independent it, very intelligent and driven guy but off on his own, you know, with his own ideas about how to do it and what, how to put it together. And it was, it was as uh, another friend of mine said at the time, you know, it's a society of lone wolves, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that has obviously changed. Mm -hmm. And it has become an industry now, um, a, a globally acknowledged industry. So, um, and, and what that means is that, well, not only is more land taken up with vineyards. I mean, when I first got here and looked out the window of the house, I couldn't see any other vineyards, you know. And now I just see vineyard after vineyard, ridge after ridge, mm -hmm. and it's and they're all around us, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that what where we will go with all of that is really thoughtful uh, viticulture mm -hmm. and really mindful land use. These are issues that we, as an industry now, have a huge stake in. We, people listen to us now mm -hmm. in a way they didn't then. Uh, we have, you know, we have senators and congressmen calling and wanting to know if they could bring their staff by for a tasting and a visit. And, you know, and of course, they're always looking for our money. And they get it to some degree, you know, and they know that. And so we have a voice mm -hmm. that we didn't have. And we can use that, you know, for better or for worse. And I think uh, my hope is that we can maintain, for searching for a term, the authenticity, the the kind of agrarian honesty of the industry that the industry was founded up mm -hmm. upon, that we can honor this incredible valley that we're we're living in. I mean, this valley. You don't have to do much research to know that the Willamette Valley is unique in the world mm -hmm. for its offerings to agriculture. It is really all totally unique. And with the amount of rainfall, the depth of the soils, the variations, uh, the, the diversity of potential products and crops, mm -hmm. it's, it is to be treasured. And uh, I grew up here and not thinking about that. All I wanted to do as a kid was escape the valley, you know. <laughs> well, I escaped the valley and now I know better. I'm back, you know, and, uh, and I can see it for the incredible place that it is. Mm -hmm. And I hope that our industry, with its voice, now on its feet and being listened to, can have a, a really positive role in, in not just preserving, because uh, I don't, preservation kind of implies stagnation to me. I don't mean that, mm -hmm. but I mean thoughtful, mindful use, land use, and, and development. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that goes into forestry management, into soil health, soil management, uh, into the use of chemicals, which obviously we do not subscribe to, um, all of those things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's, that's where I hope this industry is going to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. What does it mean to you to see a bottle labeled Oregon wine? 
Well, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's good. You know, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it always makes me happy to see that, especially if I'm elsewhere, mm -hmm. out of state, mm -hmm. you know, or abroad. You know, it's always exciting, really, to find uh, Oregon wines uh, somewhere, even in France or Germany or you know. Um, in the belly of the beast in Burgundy, <laughs> there, there we just this January came across an Oregon wine in in a restaurant in Burgundy. So, Amazing. yeah, it's great. That's great. What do you see as you look ahead for yourself personally and for Brick House as you look into the future? Is there anything on the horizon you're excited to try or uh, goals in mind or what do you see as you look sure. ahead? Sure. Well, I mean, as the goal, as the goal, as I said, the overriding goal is better wine every year. And I, I mean, so. I've already started this year. I've got a little notebook of things I'm going to experiment with in the fall when the grapes start coming in. Mm -hmm. Things we're going to do a little differently, but you know, I mean, that's a that's a we have a thankfully. On the one hand, the downside of making wine is you only get to do it once a year. The upside is you only have to do it once a year, and you have the, all the intervening months to think about what you did mm -hmm. and and what you're going to do and make it better. So. Um, yeah, better wine every year, and um, and as I said, uh, the yeast research is really important to me mm -hmm. because um, if you look, it's more than just knowing about our yeast. I mean, that's that's what it is, but it, it fits into the whole biodynamic organism mm -hmm. that I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Is you may not be able to see it when you're out somewhere in the vineyard, but there is this kind of tie that binds this common organism that is uniquely part of brick house as far as we can tell um, that is not only unique but is the organism that does the work that carries the wine over the line to dryness finishes the fermentation mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. there's no more hard work here than that and um, so we want to know more about it and that's that really excites me mm -hmm. so that's that's another place we're going in the future. Excellent. Yeah. So that's all the questions that I have for you. Okay. Uh, is there anything we should have talked about that we didn't? Anything I didn't ask that I should have? Oh gosh. That we didn't cover. It's a lot to cover. Yeah, I think we, I think we covered it yeah. all. And you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's a pleasure. No, it's what to get together with you and talk about myself <laughs> <laughs> i know it's a, it's a tough ask I know. yeah right <laughs> well thank you so much and uh, we'll go ahead and let you off the camera